so good to see you in the Lord's house today. I want you to take your Bibles. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to the book of 1 John chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 11 through 13 today. And I want to talk to you today about how to be sure about your eternity. We're talking about assurance. How to be sure about your eternity. I want you to imagine something with me. Imagine that you're taking a trip it's a far trip. You can pick the place. Maybe it's Paris. Maybe you're going to Rome. Maybe you're going to Israel. Maybe you're going to London. You're going somewhere long distance overseas. There's a flight. And you know before you get on the airplane, you know that, uh, that there are not many hotel rooms at this time in the place where you're going. And so before you get on the airplane, you call the hotel where you've made your reservations several weeks before just to check, just to confirm that you've got your reservation. And so you call and you said, hey, I'm arriving tomorrow. I'm going to be staying for so many days. I'm just calling to make sure that I've got a room when I get there. And the person from the hotel says, yes, probably. And you say, I'm sorry, did you just say I probably have a room? And they say, well, yeah. And I mean, there's like the highest probability is you probably will have a room when you get there. And you said, but I, I made a reservation. I called ahead of time and, and I, I told them when I was going to be coming and told them my name. I gave them all the information. I, I, are you saying I, I may not have a room? So what she says, well, you know, you just can't, we can't tell you for sure, but you know, probably you'll have a room. Now, so what do you do? You hang up the phone. What do you do next before you get on that airplane to fly a long, long distance to a room that you may have, you might have it, when you get there. Some of you would say, that's okay, I'll just get on the airplane, I'll take my chances, maybe I'll have a room when I get there. If she told me probably, then that's good enough for me. Some of you would do that, but most people in this room are going to say, you know what, I'm going to make sure. I'm going to call another hotel, I'm going to get on the internet, I'm going to check out a website, I'm going to do something to make sure that I know when I get to this faraway city that I'm not out on the street and homeless when I get there, that I've got a place to stay because it's a long, long trip and I can't take a long, long trip going to a room that I might have when I get there. I want to know for sure. Well, here's the truth. Every one of us is definitely going to take a trip one day called death. And we're going to face eternity somewhere. We're going to spend forever either in heaven or in hell. That's what the Word of God teaches. You're going to die, and then after that, there's judgment, and you're either going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. The question is, do you know for sure that you have a home in heaven when you die, do you know for certain that you have God's gift of eternal life? And this is one of those places where, do, where you don't want to answer, well, probably. Eternity is much too long to be wrong. And while we can go with probabilities when it comes with some things here on this earth, when it comes to where you spend eternity, you don't want to just rest on probably, you want to know. You want to know for sure. And the good news of God's word is this. God has said that you can know and that you can know for sure that you have eternal life. So I want you to stand with me as we read God's word together. We're in 1 John chapter 5. We're reading verses 11 through 13. And we're just going to start with this passage of scripture, but I'm going to show you a lot of different passages today all of them having to do with assurance. But let's begin with this passage. 1 John chapter 5, beginning in verse 11 of the text. And there John writes this. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Will you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, I pray that you would move me out of the way. And God, I pray that believers, those who have been saved, that today we would know that we have eternal life. And then, Lord, I pray for those in this room who 
may have a false assurance. They think they're saved. Lord, I pray that you would shake up that false assurance so that today they might be truly saved. Lord, I pray that you would work through your word for your glory and for the good of your people. For I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And church, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. Notice what the Word of God says, that you may know you have eternal life. God wants you to have assurance. Here's my definition of assurance. Assurance is certainty and confidence that you are truly saved, that you are a child of God, and that you have eternal life in heaven. That's what assurance is. It's certainty and confidence so that you can say, I'm saved and I know that I am. I know that I'm truly saved. I know that I'm a child of God. I know that I have eternal life in heaven. And when it comes to assurance, there are four kinds of people in this room today. First of all, there's some here today and you're unsaved and you know that you're unsaved. If I were to ask you, are you saved? You'd say, no, I'm not saved. You're unsaved and you know that you're unsaved. My goal for you today is that you'd hear the word of God and that today you would be saved and that you would know that you're saved because that's God's deepest desire for you. But some in this room are unsaved and you know that you're unsaved. Then there's a second group of people. There are people in this room who are saved, but you're plagued with doubts and you're uncertain about your salvation. And I know so many Christians who are in that boat, saved, and if you, if you ask them, you find out, yeah, they're, they're truly saved but you're just living your life plagued by doubts about whether you've been saved. Now, the truth is we're never gonna get over some doubts. In fact, part of being a Christian and, and, and part of, uh, of being saved is that, that you're gonna struggle from time to time with doubts. That's why the word of God addresses this. The great evangelist D.L. Moody was talking to someone one time and they said, I am saved and I've never had one doubt that I'm saved. And D.L. Moody looked at him and said, then I doubt you're saved. He said, because if you're saved, you're probably going to have doubts from time to time. I'm not talking about occasional doubts here. I'm talking about people in this room and you're constantly wondering, am I really saved or do I need to do something else? Am I saved? There's some in, the, in that second category, saved but played with doubts and uncertain about your salvation. There's a third group of people. There are people in this room who are unsaved and you think you're saved. Unsaved, but you think you're saved. Maybe you walked an aisle, or maybe you prayed a prayer, or maybe you've been baptized, or maybe you're a member of this church or some other church. But there's really never been genuine salvation in your life, and you're resting on a false assurance. My prayer today is that God would use his word to shake up that false assurance so that today you can be truly saved. And then there's a fourth group of people. There are people in this room who are saved, and you know that you're saved. And my goal is that today God would just use his word to encourage you and strengthen you in your assurance. So we're going to look at the passage we've read today, and we're going to think about assurance from three different angles, assurance of salvation from three different angles. And I want you to stay with me today in this message. This is a message you need to hear, and this is a message that people who you care about, maybe you're one, that one person you're praying for, that one person you're sharing the gospel it's a message that they may need to hear as well. So I want to talk to you about three angles that we can look at as we think about assurance of salvation. First of all, think with me about the availability of your assurance. The availability of your assurance. Here's what I mean by that. God wants you to know that you're saved. And real assurance of your salvation is available to you as a believer. Look with me again in verse 13 of 1 John chapter 5. And there John writes, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So was he writing to believers or unbelievers? You tell me. Believers. He's writing to believers. I write these things to you who believe. So these are saved people. He says, I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So he says, I know you believed but I want you to know that you have eternal life. You may want to just circle that word know. It means to be certain. 
It means to have confidence. It means to be sure. I want you to know, John says that, God says that. God wants you to know that you have eternal life. Assurance is available. And we need to hear that because there's some people who live their lives thinking, well, I just can't know. And there are some people who think that it's arrogant or, or egotistical to say, well, I'm saved and I know that I'm saved. No, it's not arrogant. It's not egotistical. It's not presumptuous for you to say I'm saved and I know that I'm saved. God wants you to be able to say I'm saved and I know that I'm saved. And we see that in the pages of scripture in several different places. Just one place that I want you to see, look in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And this is Paul's own testimony. Here's what he said. First, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. He says, for I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day, the day when eternity begins, what has been entrusted to me. And so Paul says, he doesn't say, I, I hope that I'm saved. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, I'm probably saved. That's not what he says. He says, I know, I'm sure about whom I have believed. And I am convinced, I am absolutely certain that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me, that is Paul's salvation. And so assurance is available. So why is it so important to have assurance? Here's why. Because until you know that you know that you're saved, your life is going to be riddled with uncertainty and robbed of the joy and the peace and the sense of purpose that God wants you to have as his child. But when you know that you're saved, then you can begin to live your life as a believer with joy and with confidence because you know that you belong to him and that you'll always belong to him. Pastor Steve Brown tells a story about a friend of his who adopted a teenage boy. And this boy had been from foster home to foster home to foster home, just shuttled from one foster home to another. And then he wound up being adopted by this family that Steve Brown was friends with. And Steve Brown tells about going and visiting the home of, of his friends when this teenage boy had just been adopted. He said, I came in, he said, I could not believe how on edge this boy was. You could tell he was just insecure about his place in that family. And he said, for that reason, he said he was just doing all kinds of things. He said he was making up his bed first thing when he got out of bed in the morning. He was vacuuming the house. He was washing the dishes at the end of every meal. He said, when a teenage boy does things like that, something is not right. And he said it was pretty easy to figure out what was going on. He had been shuttled from foster home to foster home. And now, even though he had been adopted into this family, he really wasn't sure. And so he thought, I've got to do all these things and I've got to be extra good or else I'm not going to be part of this family anymore. He said that was when he was first adopted. He said a year later, Steve Brown, he said he came back to that same home. And he said, I got there and he said, now this kid was just so secure and relaxed. He felt at home. You could tell he knew he belonged to this family. He was no longer volunteering to do everything. His father sort of had to nudge him and ask him to do things. And he said, and that was a good thing. It showed that he was secure. God doesn't want his children to be constantly wondering, am I in or am I out? Do I belong here or do I not? Am I saved or am I lost? God wants you to know that you have eternal Life. So what causes people not to have assurance? And there are a lot of different things we could talk about, but I'll just give you a few things that I believe cause people not to have assurance. One thing that causes people not to have assurance is false teaching. There's false teaching. There are churches and there are Bible teachers and pastors who falsely teach that you cannot know that you're saved or that if you step over one line and if you sin, that you can lose your salvation and no longer be saved. I was talking to a guy just a few weeks ago, and he told me, he said, I grew up in a church. And he said, my grandfather was the pastor there and is the pastor there. And he said, and they just, he said, my grandfather teaches that if you miss church, I mean, one Sunday, if you miss church, 
if you're not giving the way you should give, if you're not doing all these things, all these rules and regulations that they've established, if you don't do those things, then you're out, that you have no security as a believer. And then he told me this story. He said, uh, he said, this just happened a couple of weeks ago. Now, this guy's no longer in this church, but he, he had heard this story from people in his family who were still there. He said, a few weeks ago, a guy stood up to sing at this church where his grandfather's the pastor. He said, he got up to sing a song, and before he did, here's what he said. He said, hey, he was crying as he said it. He said, I, I just want to ask you all to forgive me. Uh, I, I've, I've, I haven't taken my family on a vacation in five years. And uh, this week, we're going to go to the mountains on vacation. And I'm going to miss church next Sunday. And we're going to be gone. We haven't missed in, in over five years. But we're going to miss next Sunday. I just want you all to forgive me. And, and then he sang the song. He's crying as he does it. After the song was over, this guy's grandfather, the pastor of the church, stands up, points to that guy and says, you better hope that Jesus Christ doesn't return next week while you're at the mountains. And I asked my friend, was he joking? He said, no, he was dead serious. Can I tell you something? That is false teaching. And so if you've heard some type of teaching that says, well, if you don't walk the line and if you step out of line, you can lose your salvation. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that when you're saved, God holds you forever. And so there's false teaching that can cause people not to have assurance. Something else that can cause people not to have assurance is just simple lack of understanding. If you don't know what the Bible teaches, and I'm going to show you some things today that I hope will be an encouragement to you if you've never been exposed to this teaching in God's Word before. Lack of understanding. Another thing that can cause people to have a lack of assurance is chronic doubt. And, and I just want to stop and acknowledge this. There's some people in this room, and you just struggle with doubts about everything. That's part of your life. And that, that may bleed over into your understanding of your own salvation. You just, you just have doubts and fears about everything. When I was a pastor in Florida, there was a, a guy in our church, and I loved him, and I got to know him. But the way I got to know him was anytime I preached a message like the message I'm preaching today, or anytime I preached a message when I was talking about, you know, making sure that you're saved, I knew he was going to come up to me after the service was over. And, and, and he had a, a obsessive compulsive disorder. He told me he did. And he said, I just worry about everything. And he said, I'm worrying constantly that I, I'm not saved. And I'm just always worried. And, and, so, and, and once I got to know him, I said, you know something? Those worries and fears and those doubts are not going to go away because that's sort of the way you're put together. And that's something you struggle with, right? He said, that's right. I said, so what you need to do is you need to know where to go to the Word of God so that you can see what God says. Because your assurance doesn't depend on your feelings. Your assurance depends on what God has said in His Word. Does that make sense to you? Say amen if it does. So I'm not talking about, you know, something that's going to, just going to be a cure-all and, and erase all of the doubts and fears if you struggle with those things. But what I want to do is show you where to go to the Word of God so that when you have those fears, when you have that, that chronic doubt, you'll know where to go. Something else that causes people not to have assurance, stress and trials. Sometimes as, as believers, we go through difficulties in life and because maybe we've been falsely taught somewhere that if you're a believer that everything is always going to be prosperity and health and wealth for you, we start thinking, well, if I'm going through these trials, maybe I'm not saved. No, the Bible says that part of the Christian life is struggle and trial, and yet sometimes that causes people not to have assurance. Something else that can cause people not to have assurance, habitual, unconfessed sin. And let me just stop right here. Some of you are here, and you, you don't feel like you're saved, and the reason you don't feel like you're saved is because you're not living like you say, you're saved. You've allowed habitual, unconfessed sin in your life and you're sort of following Jesus from a guilty distance, and you're not confessing and forsaking and asking forgiveness for that sin, and so that sin is causing you to struggle with doubt. So what do you need to do? You need to confess and forsake that sin, and God will restore to you the joy of your salvation. Something else that can cause people not to have assurance, and this one's very simple, you've never been saved. Some of you are here, and you've been in church maybe for a long time, but you've never been saved. And today, the good news of God's word is you can be saved and you can receive God's assurance. The Bible says God wants you to know that you have 
eternal life. That's the availability of your assurance. Secondly, I want you to think with me about this. Think with me about the foundation of your assurance. The foundation of your assurance. Now look in verse 11 of our text. The Bible says this, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. This is the testimony. Whose testimony? God's testimony. This is what God has said. This is the word of God. This is the testimony. Here's the testimony that God gave us eternal life. Now we're talking about the foundation of your insurance. Here's the foundation. God's testimony, God has spoken. And here's what he has said. He has given us eternal life. It's just a reminder that word gave, given, reminds us that salvation is not something we earn. Salvation is not something we work for and deserve. Salvation is not something we achieve through our religious efforts or through, through our, our moral purity because we can never achieve salvation. Salvation is something that God gives. It's the gift of God. The foundation for assurance is I have this, this, this salvation not as, anything, as the result of anything I've done. I have it as the gift of God. God gave us eternal life. And then, and this life, again in verse 11, and this life is in his son. God gave us eternal life. How did he give it? He gave it in his son. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross in your place for your sins so that you can receive God's gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sin as his gift through Jesus. That's the foundation for your assurance. And until you understand that, that it's a gift and that it depends on what Jesus Christ has done, until you understand that, you really won't have assurance. Assurance is not a feeling. Assurance is trust in what God has said. This past week, Michelle called me maybe about four o'clock in the afternoon and she said, hey, Stephen, what time do you think you're going to be home? I said, I think I'm going to be home about five after five. And she said, that's great. She said, I am cooking a pork loin for dinner and it's going to be ready at 10 after five. And she said, so if you get home at 10 after five, uh, that pork loin is going to be ready. We hung up the phone and I was so excited. I knew that there was a pork loin waiting for me when I got home at 10 after 5. And I knew that not because I had this pork loiny feeling deep inside of my heart somewhere. Not because I had some type of, you know, 10 after 5 o'clock feeling. But because I had it on the testimony of my wife that that would be ready when I got home. And when I got home, there it was. Why? Because my wife told me and because Michelle told me the truth. Well, here's what the foundation of your salvation is. Jesus Christ died for you. God has given you the gift of salvation if you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior. And that testimony cannot fail and will not lie. That's the foundation for your assurance. I want to show you a, another verse of Scripture that talks about this so powerfully. It's back in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. In John, chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, Jesus is speaking. And I just want you to hear what he says. You may want to just underline this and write it down somewhere. This is something you can share with someone who struggles with assurance and certainty. In John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says this, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. So here's what Jesus says about everyone who trusts in him for, in him for salvation. He says, I give them eternal eternal life, and they will never perish. Literally, in the original language, Jesus said never, never. He says neg two negative words. I give them eternal life, and they will never, never perish. And then he says this, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. So Jesus Christ puts you in his hand. And then he says, the Father who is greater than all has given them to me, 
and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. You are safe in the hand of Jesus. You are safe in the hand of the Father. And your assurance is secure because of the promise of God and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he's given us this promise. No one will snatch them out of my hand. There was a boy, maybe about 12 years old, and he had just gotten saved a couple of weeks before. And his mom and dad had gone out for the night, and he was in the house. And it was a dark night, and it was rainy and windy, and there was lightning and thunder. It was just a scary night. And he was sitting there on the sofa, and as he was sitting there, he just began to be frightened. It was one of the first times he had been by himself in the house at night. He started to be frightened. He was afraid something would happen to him. And then he started to be frightened that he would die. And then even, even more, he became afraid that if he died, he wouldn't go to heaven. He, he was scared about that. And so he, he, he was sitting there and he had a Bible close by that his mother had marked for him with this verse, John chapter 10, verse 28, where Jesus says, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And he read that and even as he read it, it was like there was some sinister, evil voice that came from underneath the sofa somewhere that hissed out at him and said, do you really think that no one will snatch you out of his hand? And he just began to struggle with that. He heard that voice that he thought was Satan speaking to him, that, that somehow he wasn't secure. And finally, he just looked at that and realized that that verse, no one will snatch them out of my hand, that that was a promise of Jesus. He put his finger on that verse, shoved the Bible underneath the sofa and said, there you go, Satan, read it for yourself. Hey, you can read it for yourself. Just to say, when I'm struggling with my own emotions, when I'm struggling with my own fears, Jesus has given me this foundation. God has given me eternal life. That eternal life is in his son, Jesus. And Jesus says, everyone who comes to him will never perish and no one will snatch them out of his Hand. That's the foundation for your assurance. I want you to think with me about assurance of salvation from a third angle, and I really want to camp out on this one. Number three, think with me about the test for your assurance. The test for your assurance. Now look in verse 12 of 1 John chapter 5. And here John gives a, a, an airtight case for testing whether you've truly been saved. He says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Very, very simple. How can you test your salvation? How can you test your assurance? Well, he, he states it positively and negatively. It's very important that he does it both ways. First of all, positively. Whoever has the Son has life. That means if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you've asked him, to give you his gift of eternal life and forgiveness of sin, to adopt you into God's family, to give you the promise of heaven. The Bible says, whoever has the Son has life. That's positive. Then he states it negatively. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. You say, why does he take time to state it negatively? Just to, just to sort of close the loop. Whoever has the Son has life, but then whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That means there's no other way to have eternal life than through Jesus. Being sincere won't do it. Being religious won't do it. Being moral and upstanding won't do it. Giving a certain amount of money to the church or to charity won't do it. Here's what will do it. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, I want to give you three questions to test your assurance. And, and I'm going to show you from Scripture about each one of these tests, but three questions to test your assurance. And the Word of God tells us to examine ourselves, to put ourselves to the test, to make sure we're really saved. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible says this, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, to see whether or not you're saved. Test yourselves. 
Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? So the Bible says, examine yourself. The Bible says, test yourself. And the purpose is to show whether or not you truly trust to Jesus as your Savior. So let me give you three questions to test your assurance. I hope you'll write these down. I hope you'll write these down. I hope you'll think about these three questions. The first question is this. Are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation? First simple question. Are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation? In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, someone asked Paul and Silas, what do I need to do to be saved? And they gave this answer. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So how, how do you make sure that you're saved? Are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Here's what that means. That means it's impossible to say, well, I've just always been a Christian. If you say that, that doesn't mean you've been saved. There has to be a time in your life when you trust Jesus Christ alone for God's gift of salvation. Here's what that means. Growing up in a Christian home, Growing up in church, growing up with godly parents who prayed for you, that's not the way you get saved. You have to make the decision for yourself to trust Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation. In every New Testament conversion, every time someone gets saved in the New Testament, there's a point in time when they turn from their sin and they turn to Jesus and they get saved. You say, well, pastor, I can't remember the exact day and time when I was saved. You don't have to remember the exact day and time, but there has to have been a time when you turn from your sin and turn to Jesus and were saved. That's why I've asked the question this way. Are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation? I'm not asking you about something in the past. I'm asking right now, are you trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation. A couple of weeks ago, I was preaching out in Montana for the inauguration of the new president of Montana Christian College. So I got on an airplane when I was done preaching, and I left Montana, and I came back to Oklahoma. Somewhere along the line, I crossed the Oklahoma state border. You say, when did that happen? I don't know. I was in the airplane. I don't know when it happened. You say, how do you know it happened? Here I am. So I know that, 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 that I, I passed the, the state line because here I am. So here's my question for you. Right now, do you know that you are trusting Jesus Christ and him alone for God's gift of salvation? And if you can't tell a time, if, you, if there wasn't a time in your life, I'm not telling you, saying you have to pinpoint the time and date, but you need to know that there was a point of time in your life when you prayed and asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, and to give you his gift of eternal life. If you haven't done that, then you really need to make sure that you've done that today. First question, are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Number two, second question, has Jesus Christ changed the way you live? Has Jesus Christ changed the way you live? See, there are a lot of people who can say, well, yes, I, I can tell you the time. I, well, I can tell you how old I was. I can tell you when I prayed that prayer. I can tell you when I got baptized. But there's been no change in your life. There is no biblical support to say that an unchanged life is a saved life. You can't find one time in Scripture where someone truly asked and trusted Jesus for salvation and just went on their merry way and lived their, way, their lives the way they wanted from their own. Absolutely not. Every time someone trusts Christ in Scripture, their life is transformed. So I ask you this question. Has your life been transformed? Jesus says that it's possible to call him Lord and yet for him not to know you at all. In the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. According to Jesus, just calling yourself a Christian is not enough. Just saying Jesus is my Lord, not enough. He's looking for a changed life, the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let me show you another verse of Scripture, and I want you to look at this with me, and I want you to hear a word of testimony that goes along with this verse. Titus chapter 1, verse 16. Titus chapter 1, verse 16 says this. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. They profess to know God. They say, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I know God. But they deny him by their works. I'm going to share a word of testimony from someone with you in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to say, I, I've, I've never been anything other than a Baptist. I grew up a Baptist. I've, I've never been anything other than a Baptist. I was saved in a Baptist church. I was married and ordained in a Baptist church. I pastored all Baptist churches. I've never been anything other than a Baptist. And there's something that we say sometimes as Baptists. I'll say the first part of it. You'll say the second part of it. Once saved, what? There you said it. Once saved, always saved. And can I tell you something? That's true. Once saved, always saved. Now I want to tell you this. To be always saved, you must be once saved. And there are a lot of Baptist church members who live like hell and then fall back on once saved, always saved. Mm -mm. You're not always saved if you were never once saved. And just to say, I, I walked an aisle, I prayed a prayer, I was baptized, my name's on a church roll somewhere. That means nothing in the sight of God if there is no changed life. One young woman gave this testimony. These are her words. She said, once saved, always saved, was a phrase I used to pacify my own delusions for a long time. When I was seven, I walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, and was baptized. From there on, I falsely believed I was saved for many, many years. I never examined my current walk with God. She asked, did I have fruit? No. I looked and acted and loved the world just like the world. Once saved, always saved was a phrase she said, I used to pacify my own delusions for a long time. Look at Titus chapter 1 verse 16 again. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Some of you are praying for a son or a daughter to come back to the Lord. And the truth is they've never come to the Lord. They've never been saved. You say, why are you bringing this up? Because I want you to deal with them where they really are. The issue isn't just that they need to get some things right. The issue may be that they need to be saved. Because one of the things that shows we're saved is a changed life. There's some people in this room. And maybe you've just, you're in church, you're in church today, right? But you know that there's no change in your life. And you're falling back on some decision, some superficial decision that you made a long time ago. And there's no present reality of Jesus Christ working in your life. You need to ask yourself the question, am I truly saved? Are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Number two, has Jesus Christ changed the way you live? Number three, does the Holy Spirit, here's the third question, does the Holy Spirit provide an inner assurance that you are saved? Does the Holy Spirit provide an inner assurance 
that you're saved. The Bible promises that. In Romans chapter 8, verse 16, the Bible says this, and the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of every believer will bear witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. One way that the Holy Spirit does that is by convicting you of sin. When you're a believer and you sin against God, the Holy Spirit of God will convict you of that sin. That's part of how he bears witness. And sometimes this may seem a little strange, and, but I believe it's true. Sometimes even our doubts are things that the Holy Spirit uses to bear witness that we belong to God. I heard the testimony of Iris Blue. Iris Blue was a prostitute in Texas. And a pastor came to the, the place where she was working shared the gospel of Christ with her. And she got saved. He was, he was there out on the sidewalk ministering to, to the people where she was working and, and, and got saved. She got saved. And she said she had been saved for about one week. And she woke up in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock in the morning concerned, was she really saved? She's just really struggling. Am I really saved? She called that pastor she said, I'm struggling. Am I really saved? I'm not sure that I'm really saved. How can I know that I'm saved? And he said, Iris, before you got saved, did you ever wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and call somebody on the phone to ask them if you were saved? She said, no. He said, that's pretty good evidence that you're saved. The Holy Spirit will work in your heart and give you a concern about your own salvation and give you a conviction about your own sin and bear witness that you are saved. Three questions. I want you to ask these three questions of yourself. Are you trusting Jesus Christ alone for salvation? Has Jesus Christ changed the way you live? Does the Holy Spirit provide an inner assurance that you're saved? A couple of weeks ago at our Leading Forward Leadership Forum, Bob Hoffman, who's the University of Central Oklahoma men's basketball coach. He's a member of our church. He usually attends our third service. And he was just sharing his testimony and sharing about how he does what he does as a follower of Jesus. And Bob told about a book that he had been reading by Jimmy Dykes. Jimmy Dykes is an ESPN sports analyst. Jimmy Dykes wrote a book called The Film Doesn't Lie, Evaluating Your Life One Play at a Time. And in that book, Jimmy Dykes just talks about how football teams and basketball teams, they get together at LSU. It's called Tell the Truth Monday. And they sit down and they watch that game tape, whether they won or lost. They sit there, sit there and watch that tape. And they examine every play and what happened. No headphones are allowed. No cell phones are allowed. Everybody's got their notebooks open. Sometimes 20 or 30 players and coaches giving combined hundreds of hours of time just to watch that game play by play to see what happened. Why? Because the film does not lie. And then he says this at the, at the end of one of the first chapters. He says, you need to watch your own film. And he says, how honest and transparent you will be with yourself and with God is the key. How do you have assurance? You need to watch your own film. And just look at the film. Are you trusting Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation? Has your life been changed by Jesus? Does the Holy Spirit give you an inner assurance that you're a child of God? If you would say yes to all those things, then praise the Lord. You can praise God for the assurance he's given you. But there are some in this room today, and you really struggle at some of those points. And today, you need to get things right with Jesus Christ.